Hello, MCU fans. Today, we're going to be ordering over 100 key flashbacks from the movies and shows into the overall MCU timeline. And I hope you find this as interesting and as informative as I have. This, to me, is fascinating. In fact, I've meant to get this video out for the last several days, but I've been a bit under the weather, and you might hear it a little bit in my voice, so sorry about that. But yeah, we're going to go through all of these flashbacks and then make sure to stay to the end, because I'm also going to show that they've been added to the MCU spreadsheet on my Google Drive, and it's just wild to see how it all organizes together. So without further ado, let's dive right in and see what we can find out. So I always have to give a very important and key shout out to the Marvel Cinematic Universe wiki. I would not have even tried to do a video like this if not for the wiki. There is so much information out there, way more than I could ever contain in this video with footnotes for every single placement and why they put them there. Uh, there's also a wiki discord if you're interested. And then Robbie and Drew, you guys are rock stars. Love you both. Thank you so much for all your help. Okay, so one question I had going into this is, where do the flashbacks fall in relation to the overall timeline at a high level? You know, you've got Captain America, the first Avenger, which from a timeline standpoint is the first movie in the timeline. And then you've got Iron Man, which is the first movie that was released by Marvel. So with these two key movies in, in, in mind, where do the flashbacks fall? Well, 36 of them are actually even before Captain America, the first Avenger, all the way back to the dawn of time, in fact. Another 38 fall in between these two movies. And then finally, 28 fall in what I would call the modern era of the MCU, you know, post-Iron Man. So this just kind of gives you a general sense of where we're going to see these flashbacks. Really cool that they pretty much go through all of time up to present day. So I mentioned the dawn of time. That's where we're going to start. The beginning of time with the Celestial's arrival. So in the Eternals movie, we get the crawl uh, that gives us tons of information, and particularly the first paragraph that comes up is so important, I'm going to have to break it into three pieces. So it starts with, in the beginning, before the six singularities, which those are eventually going to become the infinity stones, and we'll learn that, and the dawn of creation, i.e. the Big Bang, came the celestials. We don't know where they came from. We don't, know, we don't know why they came. We don't know why they were created. There's lots to learn there, and hopefully over time we'll learn more. But the key is, the very first thing is the arrival of the celestials. However, the celestials apparently were not alone because we learned from Thor the Dark World that the Dark Elves came around this time. Odin says long before the birth of light, i.e., you know, the Big Bang, there was darkness. And from that darkness came the Dark Elves. That just is wild to me. I'd never really put all this together. That's why I say I love all these flashbacks being put in chronological order because you start to think about things. So you basically have, before there's even the Big Bang, you got the Celestials and the Dark Elves hanging out, doing whatever the heck they're doing. I mean, who created the Dark Elves? Why were they created? Fascinating stuff. I would love a little more lore behind that. But nonetheless, we got, we got complete darkness, and we got Celestials and Dark Elves hanging out. But they're not alone, because as we learn in Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one, the Collector says before creation itself, there were six singularities, which, of course, again, these will become eventually the Infinity Stones. All right, so now we can come back to this uh, opening paragraph. So we learn there were Celestials, Dark Elves, and eventually the Six Singularities. Then, Ereshem, the Prime Celestial, created the first sun and brought light into the universe. Now, notice we finally have a date, 13.8 billion years ago. So where did we get that? Well, scientists have come up with that. Scientists have said that the Big Bang occurred 13.79999 repeating or something. I'm going with 13.8 billion years ago. Now, I don't know where they came up with that number, and you got to kind of crack up a little bit. Somehow we know what happened 13.8 billion years ago, but we can't get our bus system to run on time. <laughs> Go figure, right? I don't know. But hey, that's what scientists say, so we're going to use that. So in 13.8 13 billion years ago, Erishim, boom, does the Big Bang, creates the universe. Awesome. So that's going to lead then to uh, back to Guardians of the Galaxy. As the Collector explains, then the universe exploded into existence. Now notice he didn't say how or why, but we learned from Eternals, it was the Celestials. So that's cool. Uh, and the remnants of these systems were forged into concentrated ingots. Infinity Stones. So very cool, right? The, all, the, that's where we got our Infinity Stones, and that's why they're so important to the function of our universe. 
Uh, basically, they were created with the universe, so time and space and mind and soul, etc., reality. They all are tied intrinsically to our universe. Very, very cool. So yes, that is the creation of the Infinity Stones. All right, so this is kind of a little freebie. I didn't even put this in the spreadsheet because it's not necessarily canon. It's, it's more of a behind the scenes with Jeff Goldblum explaining all this, not the collector himself. But this does go with pretty understand, understood lore, which is, he's saying, even though I've lived since shortly after the Big Bang, and then he says 14 million years instead of billion. But yeah, many believe that the elders of the universe, the Grandmaster and the Collector, were created soon after the Big Bang and have been around all that time. Um, another thing that would be interesting for Marvel to tell us, right? What created them? Who created them? Why were they created? Um, but nonetheless, I, I mean, it's in the wiki, in the wiki's timeline. I just didn't put it in my official one because we don't actually get it anywhere in a flashback. It was just kind of Jeff Goldblum free associating and, and clearly using the wrong uh, million instead of billion. But nonetheless, pretty cool to think that the Collector and Grandmaster came soon after the Big Bang. All right, so then we move forward to the creation of our solar system itself. And scientists say that is 4.54 billion years ago. So great, we're going to go with that. Uh, life began and thrived. All was in balance. Then, um, now this one, the, the wiki does have a slightly different date on this, but I'm going to go with 1 billion BC for Tiamat being seeded because, uh, Arishem explains, every billion years, new celestials must be born. And the planet Earth was chosen to host the celestial Tiamat. Well, if it's every billion years, then presumably a billion years ago they planted the seed. And we don't really know any more than that, but that, it certainly seems that way. So that kind of gives us a relative to uh, when the solar system was created versus when uh, Tiamat's seed was planted. So that's kind of interesting. All right, so then uh, Arisham goes on to explain that the deviants are sent to allow intelligent life to grow, because that's necessary for the emergence, for Tiamat's emergence. Every celestial host planet has its own predators, so I first sent the deviants to exterminate them. And then, of course, unfortunately, the deviants became predators themselves. So it's unclear exactly when the deviants would have been sent in relation to when Tiamat was sent, but one would think those would be in pretty close, close proximation. So we're going to go with, again, the 1 billion BC for when the deviants first arrived. Obviously, lots happened since then. All right, so this one is admittedly a big-time guess. But there is some logic behind the placement of when Ego was born. 80 million years ago, uh, BC is what's being used. And so in Guardians 2, uh, Ego flashes back and says, uh, first thing I remember is flickering, adrift in the cosmos, utterly and entirely alone. Over millions of years, that's key, millions of years, I learned to control the molecules around me. And of course, that's when he formed the planet. Now, this does raise some questions of, again, how did Ego get created? Why was he created? Why was he just a brain floating in space? I would just love some backstory on this. I, it's, just, it's fascinating. This stuff just fascinates me. But anyway, trying again to place, when was this happening? At one point, Star-Lord says, you know, like, am I going to be able to do this stuff since I'm part celestial, uh, like the way you made the whole planet? And he says, well, it might take you a few million years of practice. So we're getting the idea that it's more than a million years ago. And then at one point, he even says, over the millions and millions of years of my existence, and then uh, talks about how Star-Lord's not a mistake and some other things. But the key there is millions and millions. Okay. Well, he doesn't say hundreds of millions. So presumably, it's less than 100 million years ago. But he does say millions and millions. So the wiki goes through some uh, calculations to try to come up with something. Bottom line is they land on 80, 80 million uh, B.C., we don't know, and maybe the timeline book is going to tell us, right? But the real key here isn't whether or not it was 80 million or 60 million or 50 million. Relatively speaking, though, it was less than 100 million, but multiple millions, right? So it just gives us an idea of these placements in a relative timeline. So I think it's cool. Uh, you may disagree on the 80 million, but you get the idea of exactly uh, where it falls within some of the other flashbacks, right? And that's the real goal of this. All right, so also... The, uh, the wiki places some of the uh, Celestial's actions that were talked about in the Guardians um, by, by the Collector around this same time frame. Really no reason other than maybe that's what created Ego. Wouldn't that be interesting? If the, if the Celestial's using things like the Mind Stone, 
might have just, boom, created ego into existence. That's kind of cool, really. But anyway, so in particular, the collector shares how um, the uh, celestials use the, the power stone, in this case, to mow down entire civilizations. He also talks about a group that was able to share the energy among themselves, but they were quickly destroyed by it. So these flashbacks, are the wiki's placing around the same time. I also do think it's kind of cool, uh, knowing the ending of Guardians, how this was you know, kind of giving us a hint of how, how things were going to go down, because the Guardians, as a group, do use the Power Stone, and they're not destroyed simply because of um, Star-Lord being half-celestial. So pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, so this one, we actually end up with a pretty cool specific date. So 2.5 million B.C., the vibranium meteor, or meteors, as we now know, land on the Earth. So at the narration at the beginning of Black Panther just simply says, millions of years ago, a meteorite made of vibranium. So where do we get 2.5? Because that's pretty specific. Well, there's a book that came out called The Art of Black Panther. It's really cool, uh, beautiful artwork. But it mentions in it a date. Now, is this canon? Who knows, right? Some of these books, are, they're just putting something down on paper. But that's all we're trying to do too, right? We're just trying to get some of these dates uh, to, to work. So uh, this works for me, 2.5 million years ago. All right, then that's when the meteor hit, okay? Then we have another thing from the uh, flashback from the Black Panther movie. 28,000 BC, the five tribes settled the land of Africa. Uh, and the narration explains, and this is key, and when the time of man came, keep that in mind, and when the time of man came, five tribes settled on it and called it Wakanda, and the tribes lived in constant war with each other. So why 28,000 BC? Okay, unfortunately, the art of uh, the Black Panther book doesn't go into this one, doesn't give us a date. So uh, makes sense that the Marvel Cinematic Universe wiki would look at Wikipedia for a potential answer. And under the entry on the evolution of human intelligence, uh, you can see it's highlighted, it's believed that fully modern behavior, including figurative art, music, self-ornamentation, trade, burial rites, etc., is evident by 30,000 years ago. Okay, well, the movie came out in 2018, so 2018 minus 30,000 is just being rounded to 28,000 B.C., that works, right? It gives us a relative idea, and especially since Wakanda has always been advanced, it's, it's certainly believable that those tribes settled soon after this emergence of human intelligence occurred. So, all right, I like it. That works. Uh, then we go to another flashback from the Black Panther movie, and this one we're able to place a lot more specifically. 8,000 BC, the first Black Panther arrives. So the narration explains, until a warrior shaman received a vision from the Panther goddess Bast. The warrior became king and the first Black Panther. So where do we get 8,000 BC? Well, in this book, again, uh, The Art of Black Panther, notice it says, from the first Black Panther, Bashenga, born 10,000 years ago. So movie came out in 2018, minus 10,000, so rounding to 8,000 BC. Cool. And then this one actually gets backed up again because there's a very recent series that came out on Disney Plus called Empower. It was, uh, came out during Women's History Month and talks about the women of the Marvel Universe. Really cool. If you haven't watched it, it's well worth watching. The episodes are great. But the ones on the women of Black Panther, they show us this quick look at what they call the Bible. I wish they would release this thing because it's got some really cool dates in it. But notice, Birth of Wakanda, there it is again. 8,000 BC or BCE in this case, but same difference, is when we got Bashenga. So yeah, that's two different sources giving us a state. Pretty solid. We'll go with 8,000 BC. All right. This is really interesting. So consider all that was happening in Wakanda, and that's all before the deviants were, uh, were uh, sorry, the Eternals were sent to take care of the deviants. They didn't arrive until 5,000 BC, which on this one, we get a specific date in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Isn't that interesting to consider that all of those things were happening in Wakanda, even though the deviants were Roman free and causing trouble. So either they weren't, you know, attacking Wakanda or the Wakandans fought them off. You know, who knows, right? Just more interesting stuff when you place all this stuff in order. You see what I mean about how interesting it is to place things in chronological order. All right, so the Eternals arrive, right? And, you know, the, we, we see other examples of modern man, if you will, or, or prehistoric man. And, of course, you got to get the group shot in, right? Got to love the group shot. And the Eternals fight off some of the deviants and even help 
um, the um, the Mesopotam- Mesopotamians with some weapons so they can fight them off themselves. All right, so that's 5,000 BC. So then we jump to a very specific year. <laughs> You'll see why in a second, but 2988 BC. That's when in Thor the Dark World, we see Malekith in a flashback observing the c- convergence. And his goal, as we learned earlier, well, you know, the Dark Elves want to get back to darkness, right? They were there before there was a Big Bang. That's where they'd like to go back. They want to destroy all of this and, and go back to darkness. So where do we get 2988? Well, later in the movie, Thor explains that every 5,000 years, the worlds align perfectly. So every 5,000 years, you get a convergence. Movie came out in 2013. 2013 minus from 5,000 gets you to 2988 BC. And in case you try to do the math and say it's off by a year, like I did at first, there is no zero BC or zero AD. So I said, darn it, darn that Star Wars. Star Wars with the zero BBY, that's what really messes me up. I keep thinking there's a zero. There's not a zero. But anyway, nonetheless, that's how we get 2988 BC for the flashback in Thor the Dark World. All right. Another pretty specific date, 2476 BC, the Dweller in Darkness attacks. So the narration explains to us in Shang-Chi's flashback that thousands of years ago, all of our people lived in peace and prosperity until the the attack of the Dweller in Darkness. Together they pushed the Dweller and his army into the Dark Gate and locked it behind them. So that's when the Dweller attacked and then was put behind the gate. And of course you remember the Dweller was the one that was calling at Wenwu, telling him his wife was back there and made Wenwu want to open the gate again to lead to the final battle in Shang-Chi. Um, so why 2476? Well, we learn at one point in the movie, in Talo, our people have been here for over, that's key, over 4,000 years, preparing for something we hope will never happen. That would be, of course, the Dweller in Darkness escaping. So what the wiki will often do is say, okay, they said over 4,000, but they didn't say 5,000. So it's greater than 4,000, it's less than 5,000. We'll split it down the middle at 4,500. And then, of course, this movie came out in 2024. So 2024, 4,000 years before that, you get 2476. So that's kind of cool. It makes sense, right? I mean, again, these are approximations, but they're just to try to get some idea of where these are falling in the overall timeline. And hopefully the timeline book will tell us exactly when it was, but for now, that approximation of splitting down the middle of 4,500 years ago, that works. It works. All right, so 995 BC, the Kree Scroll War begins. Where did we get this? Well, this is kind of frustrating, honestly. There are some very helpful, from a lore standpoint at least, deleted scenes with Captain Marvel's movie. We're going to see it uh, down the road, too, a second time, where these deleted scenes give us some really important information and... You know, are deleted scenes canon? I don't personally think so, but at least they give us an idea where to place this. All right, so Jan Rog is training some cadets and says, how long has the Kree Scroll War been going on? And they respond, thousands of years, to which he echoes, thousands of years. Well, that doesn't help us a lot. We know it's more than a thousand, probably less than, you know, multiple thousands, like tons of thousands. So, we're going with 2,000 for now, just to give a relative place. It could have been three or 4,000. I mean, we really just don't know, but it's at least 2,000. So we'll go with 995 BC because that's uh, 2,000 years earlier than uh, when uh, Captain Marvel came out in 1995. All right, so then we have... Now, th- you talk about really, really, really trying to guess. This, this is a very hard one to place. So from Thor Ragnarok, we have the mural flashback, if you will, of Odin and Hela subjugating the nine realms, and then Odin realizing Hela is just, you know, out of control, and him ultimately banishing her. So we know a couple things. We know this has to be way before Thor was born, way before most of the Asgardians that we see in the Thor movies were born, because they didn't know who she was. Remember, she shows up, and none of them know who she is. So this is so long ago that people have just literally forgotten about it. But that doesn't help us much. So we know it's a long time ago, but how about something more? Well, uh, Kate Blanchett, who played Hela, obviously, she gave an interview for comicbook.com, and she says, I think if you were locked under Asgardian stairs for 5,000 years, you'd be a bit cross. Okay, that is helpful, but not as helpful as it might seem, because we do learn from movies like Thor 2, Thor the Dark World, uh, when Odin says, we're not gods, we're born, we live, 
we die, just as humans do. And Loki says, oh, give or take 5,000 years. Now, assuming that he means that, and he's, he's right, then that would say 5,000 years is their max age. If that's their max age, then Hela couldn't possibly have been banished that entire time, or she'd be dead. So the wiki goes ahead and says, all right, we're going we're to cut that in half, and then we're going to add some time for Hela to be born and for, you know, for her to have, because they look at her approximate age of the actress. They'll do this quite often. It makes sense. As I look at Kate Blanchett's age during the movie, which I think was 47, if I recall, and then they try to do the math. And so they kind of split it down the middle and went with more like 2,500 years ago. This is clearly a guess, clearly a guess. But again, the most important things to note are it has to be a long time before Thor uh, was born and very likely uh, somewhere in the realm of the of the 5,000 year range. So, all right, this is one I would really like for them to give us in the timeline book, a specific, but for now I applaud the wiki and their work to try to come up with something using as much logic as possible. All right, so thank you, Marvel, for giving us a specific date here, 575 BC, Babylon, the Battle of Babylon and the Eternals. And one of the most important things that happened is this is when Ajax first started expressing doubt about the mission of the Eternals. You can see her standing there, little dinky uh, Ajax standing before Ereshem. So uh, this flashback was 575 BC. All right, so then we move to 400 AD. So notice we have jumped out of the BC time frame into AD. Now, I understand in the movie why they put AD so that you knew it jumped forward to AD, but I'm not going to put AD every time. That's kind of assumed from here on out. Everything is AD. But anyway, 400 AD is important because that is when Circe and Icarus were married. So we got that flashback from Eternals. Uh, then we move to a flashback from Thor Ragnarok, and this is when the Valkyries, plural, battle Hela and are massacred. Uh, it's placed in 950, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but let's look at some key things here. So Valkyrie is explaining to Thor in the movie when she, Hela, tried to escape her banishment. He sent the Valkyrie in to fight her back. So what do we learn from this? Well, number one, we learn that uh, it's while uh, Hela was still ba uh, banished, and um, she escaped, and obviously the Valkyrie had to fight them off. But also, if you remember in the movie, Thor thought the Valkyrie were all legend, didn't even know they were still alive anymore. So this has to happen before Thor is born. And we'll see in a second when he is born. We're coming up to that. So the wiki takes all of that in consideration, as well as it often looks at the ages of the actresses or actors in the scenes in relation, in the flashback, in relation to present day. So since they seem to be around the same ages, um, they placed it not too much before uh, Thor's birth, so at 950 uh, AD. But again, this is just a guess. It'll be helpful if the wiki, I'm sorry, if the timeline book, uh, when it comes out, gives us something official. But for now, I applaud the wiki for trying to come up with these dates, and 950 makes sense. All right, so then we move to 965 AD. So thank you again, Marvel, for giving us a specific date. And this is when Odin battles the Frost Giants. Of course, he first battles them in Norway and, the, and uh, ultimately in the Jotunheim, uh, and he fights Lofi, uh, obviously. And so this is when uh, we know that Thor, around the time when Thor was born, because we're also going to see it's around a time that, that Loki is adopted. Um, so at the, real quick, though, this is kind of fun. So we learned that the Eternals actually helped in this battle. Uh, Gilgamesh, who's being punked by Sprite, which is why he's wearing that outfit, uh, says, yours is a secret brew that Odin taught me as a thank you after we helped defeat Lofi's army in Tunsberg. So that's kind of fun, right? That the Eternals were part of that battle against uh, Lofi. But as I alluded to, what's really important is this is when Loki was adopted, little pouty, little pouty Loki. Uh, so likewise, that would be around the time when Thor was born. And we get a flashback in Thor Love and Thunder of Thor riding with Frigga in the battle. And I love that. And he's like one year old, probably. I love this. Baby, coo uh, baby Thor is cooing. And of course, baby Loki is pouting. Makes sense, right? Cooing, pouting. <laughs> cooing, pouting. <laughs> Just the two brothers personified by their faces. It's perfect. Uh, but anyway, this is placed at 965. Um, then we have a couple scenes of Thor running, which I thought, ah, we'll put these in. This is fun. The way the wiki dated these is by looking at the age of the actors, in this case, uh, Hemsworth's own son, uh, in relation to then uh, what we know when he was born, which would be around the 965 time frame. So we get that one. Uh, then in 975, we see them, uh, both Loki and uh, uh, Thor. 
being told about that Battle of Jotunheim. This is a flashback from the first Thor movie. Uh, then we get a teenage Thor running through the forest. And again, they looked at the age of the actor in this scene and used that to forward date from when Thor was born. And there's more scenes, by the way, of him running and stuff. I don't put them in because those are next to impossible to pick a date. I mean, that's really just flip a coin. So this is the last one of that running scene that I include. Um, all right, so then we jumped to 1014 which is the Kree and Nova Empire War begins. So the Kree have already been fighting the Skrull for at least a thousand years, if not more, and now they pick a fight with the Nova Empire. Goodness gracious. So where did we get this one? Okay, this one, he's more specific this time around. He says, a thousand years of war, not thousands, but a thousand years of war between us will not be forgotten. All right, if we take him literally that it's a thousand, because why not, then this movie came out in 2014. Well, that's pretty easy, right? Uh, 1014. So the key, though, is that the Kree have been fighting with two different empires for quite some time. Boy, they love it, love to be the bullies of, of the universe. All right, so then we have Wen Wu discovering the Ten Rings. So where do we get 1015? Um, so first of all, we learn that the legend of the Ten Rings has been told for thousands of years. So the rings themselves have clearly been around for a long time. But let's talk about Wen Wu. They then say, and this is all flashbacks from Shang-Chi, obviously, but at its center, there was always one man. And we learn that he chased money and power for a thousand years. Okay, so that would imply that that's when he got the rings, that he's had them for a thousand years. Uh, then also we learn in the uh, end credit scene, uh, when Captain Marvel asks, how long did your, dad, dear, did your dad have them before he gave them to you? Sorry. Uh, and Shang-Chi says, oh, about a thousand years. Okay. So first of all, he says about, so it could be more. Um, but there was also a period of time when he didn't wear them, if you remember. Uh, he, he took them off uh, when, when Shang-Chi was younger because he was just going to stay and be with uh, his wife and not, not, have, not do the conquest with the rings. So they take that into account too, which is probably why this is not uh, 1024 because obviously Shang-Chi movie is in 2024. But nonetheless, they place uh, him finding the ring in 1015. Um, so one more thing that I hope that the timeline book gives us an official date on, but for now, I, I love what the wiki's done with this research. Okay, then we have, when did Odin hide the Tesseract in Tonsberg, Norway? Um, and this is mentioned by uh, the Red Skull himself uh, when he says the, the Tesseract was the jewel of Odin's treasure room. So at some point, it was no longer the jewel of the treasure room and was, was hid away in Norway. So when did that happen? Well, here we're going to look at this timeline that Marvel put out in 2012. It's really cool if you've never seen it. It harmonizes all the movies up to Avengers. Um, and notice they say that 600 years ago, BIM, uh, that's their zero point. And that's uh, when um, Tony Stark said, I am Iron Man. So BIM is before I am Iron Man. Kind of cool, right? Got to find a zero point. May as well be the, the most important point in the Marvel, or Marvel Universe. Yeah. So 600 years before that point, Odin leaves the Tesseract on Earth. Now, I personally think Iron Man happens in 2010. But the wiki places in 2009. Some people even place it in 2008. So wherever you place it, 600 years before that, that's when this happened. So... Uh, it is such a mess with those movies in phase one. They were retconned so many times that no one can agree on their specific placement. And I can't wait. I cannot wait for the timeline book to just say, here, here is when they happen. Let's just move on. But for now, there's still debates. So you can, you can move that in your own personal timeline wherever you want. All right, so then we have another specific date. Thank you, Marvel. 1521, that's when the Eternals eliminate the Deviants for good. Well, they think for good. They do come back, as you know from the movie. But the Eternals eliminate the Deviants. Uh, Athena has her Mad Weary experience uh, where she uh, remembers uh, past life, her past life, and the Eternals disagree on what to do next and part ways. So that's a very important flashback, 1521. All right, 1571, from Wakanda Forever, we learn is when Namor is born. So that date is obviously specifically given to us. Uh, and of course, there he is being born. 
Uh, but the next one isn't specifically given in the movie, but the next flashback is when he buries his mother. So I'm turning to the script here, and this is ultimately what the wiki does as well, and says, okay, 1631, great. We'll use that. That's what, at least from a script standpoint, they were intending it to be. So works good, 1631. All right, then we move to 1693, and that's when Agatha Harkness is put on trial. We learned this from WandaVision episode eight um, during the Salem witch trials, okay? Uh, and yeah, it just it did not go good for her at first, and then she absorbed the energy of all the other witches. So very, very important date in history, and I'm wondering if the Coven of Chaos movie is going, or, or TV show, rather, is going to include more information about what happened back in this time frame. All right, so then we jump all the way to 1936. So Steve's mother dies, uh, and Bucky expresses his friendship with that immortal line, I'm, I'm with you to the end of, end of the line, pal. I'm with you to the end of the line. Gotta love it. All right, so then we jump to 1940. So we're almost finally up to Captain America uh, with this period of flashbacks. And that is when Johann Schmidt is injected with the super soldier serum, because uh, you remember he already had it by the time of the movie, which starts in early 1942. So it's in late 1940 that he injects himself with that super soldier serum. Uh, so then we finally get to Captain America. I'm obviously not going to focus on all the movies themselves. You can see those. In fact, we'll see at the end, again, on my MCU timeline, everything is put in one place. I'm just going to focus on the flashbacks for this video. But relatively speaking, we're talking about now the time frame of the beginning of Captain America. So Aisha and the clandestines find the bangle. Um, now this one actually we're able to pretty accurately place because while they don't give a date at first, when this first flashback happens and notes the 10 rings down there too, um, you know, when she finds the bangle, they don't really tell us much. However, a later episode flashes back to British occupied India. And basically Aisha, keep an eye on that costume that she's wearing or her outfit rather that she's wearing. Aisha then flees British troops who literally were bombing that place where they found the bangle. And then we pick her up with her running and wearing basically that same outfit. So presumably this second flashback is right after uh, they find the bangle and all the clandestines separate. They don't even see each other for several years. Meanwhile, Aisha and Hassan meet um, and Hassan is giving his speech. Uh, if we have to fight, we will fight. Uh, we have given our blood to this land for thousands of years. So that is 1942 because well, they tell us it's 1942. All right, so then we have another flashback from Miss Marvel that jumps forward, and Aisha is now pregnant. Now, how do we know this is 1944? Well, we can date it really by Sana's age, their daughter, uh, and uh, Miss Marvel's grandmother, obviously. And at this point, she's not born yet, but we know in 1947 she's around three, so she's very close to being born at this point. Okay, so then we take a brief digression here to Fastos, who mourns his impact on the world with the end of uh, World War II and the bombing of Hiroshima. And he just, you know, mourns the fact that I, I did this. It's my fault. It's my fault. Uh, so fascinating um, look into, you know, the, the effect that he and his scientific knowledge had on the world. Uh, then we also look at Operation Paperclip. Very, very important. In 1945, in fact, we actually have a date there specifically. You can see in August of 1945, uh, Operation Paperclip begins. And this is a flashback, uh, the concept of Operation Paperclip uh, from The Winter Soldier. When uh, Natasha is explaining Operation Paperclip was after World War II and S.H.I.E.L.D. recruited German scientists with strategic value. And of course, one of those main scientists was Arnim Zola. So this is how Arnim Zola got himself into S.H.I.E.L.D. and thus Hydra began to infiltrate S.H.I.E.L.D. So very important flashback uh, to 1945. All right, soon after that, we have a real quick little flashback of now Sana is born, uh, again, Miss Marvel's grandmother, and Aisha is singing to her. Um, she's probably, you know, well under a year old at that point. All right, so then we jump to 1947 when Najma and the clandestines finally uh, meet up with Aisha, uh, all this time, they've been looking for her to figure out, you know, what, where did the bangle go? What are you doing with it, etc. Things may start out okay with some hugs, but they do not end well with ultimately Najma killing uh, Aisha. But most importantly is, and we get a specific here, August 15th of 1947, this is when Kamala ends up traveling back in time. Not my favorite concept. I don't really like closed loop time travel, but I really liked this episode. It was fascinating to learn about the partition. And in particular, we see how Kamala ends up being the one that leads Sana back to Hassan, basically saving her from being left behind and, you know, fulfills 
Kamala even existing, which is why you end up having the closed loop uh, time travel. All right, so that's those flashbacks. Now then we move to 1950, uh, when Bucky Barnes becomes the Winter Soldier. So one of the things they show us in the flashback is that he was, I mean, rescued, if you want to use that term, but collected uh, by uh, Russian soldiers. It's unclear when this happened. Probably this piece of the flashback is soon after uh, he falls in the snow. But here's the thing. We don't know because, remember, Steve Rogers was sent in suspended animation because of the super so- soldier serum. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, likewise, Bucky may have been in laying there in the ice for a while. We just don't know. So I'm not going to try to place when he was pulled out of the ice, but we do know that from the Russian prison, eventually Arnim Zola uh, came and started doing the experimentation on him. And that that is around 1950 time frame, And you'll see why as we delve into this a little bit more. Of course, that's Arnim Zola saying you are to be the new fist of Hydra. So this is interesting. And this is why I really love putting all these flashbacks again in chronological order and analyzing how they dovetail off each other. So we learn in Falcon and the Winter Soldier that Isaiah Bradley is experimented upon uh, in America, obviously, right around this same time using the super soldier serum. And we learn that because uh, he talks about the fact that a handful of us got shot up with different versions of that serum. And in particular, then, uh, Bucky says, we, being him and Isaiah Bradley, had a skirmish during the Korean War. So that's around the time when Isaiah Bradley was shot up with the serum. And the Korean War started in the 50, uh, uh, 1950, as I recall. Um, and then he even says, we met in 1951. And of course, Isaiah Bradley says, well, if you mean we met by like I kicked your butt. But so isn't that interesting? That means both of them became you know, uh, Isaiah Bradley became um, active and then Winter Soldier became active around the same time and then had that first conflict within about a year of, of um, you know, starting the, the, their crusades, if you will. So th- I think that's really, really interesting how they're so linked. I mean, the show kind of touched on it, but when you lay all this out, it's very, very interesting to see how they uh, tie together. All right, so then we move to 1953, and in The Winter Soldier, we get this uh, interview with the Smithsonian done by Peggy Carter, and she talks about Steve Rogers. It's really sweet. Uh, But that's when this happens chronologically. All right, then we jump all the way up to 1973. Howard Stark filming the promo for the 1974 Stark Expo, and that was a big part, of course, of Iron Man 2. It's how Iron Man, uh, Tony Stark, figured out the new element to put in his arc reactor so that he wasn't dying any longer from it. So, yeah, that's where this flashback came into play. All right, then we have, and this is really cool, with Guardians 3 right around the corner, right? Uh, no spoilers, by the way. This is all flashbacks to the previous movies, but these will, this will help enhance your uh, viewing experience, I suspect, of the movie. So in 1978, that's when this flashback occurred of Ego and Meredith falling in love because Ego said they met several times, several times before Peter was then ultimately conceived. Now, why am I putting this in 1980? All right, we know that because we get the flashback in Guardians 2 that tells us, 1980. So why am I saying he was conceived, though, before this flashback? Well, we're going to see there's a couple reasons. But a big one is James Gunn told us so. (laughs) you got to love the guy, man. He is on Twitter all the time. And this is an older tweet. came out around the time of the movie. But he says, I can't believe how many people have asked me this. Guys, the pregnancy is only nine months, and she could already be pregnant at the start of two. So the reason this is important is for uh, Star-Lord's age and the timing of things. So basically, that means he was uh, conceived a little bit before this flashback, and this was probably the last time that uh, Ego went back to visit Meredith. Uh, There they are in the car, chilling and singing. And if you see her in the movie, if you think of the movie, she's not very pregnant, more like eight weeks pregnant at this point. But she's definitely pregnant. It it has to be. All right, so we're going to Go to a couple of the flashbacks, and then we'll be back again to Star-Lord. So in 1987, that's when Hank and Janet have their ill-fated mission. Hank says, it was 1987, so we have no doubt. Uh, And of course, we get flashbacks in both Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp to this event with some really cool de-aging of uh, Janet there. And of course, the mission they're talking about is stopping that missile where Janet ends up having to go subatomic. So it's in 1987 that she enters the quantum realm where we pick up with her in the Quantum Mania movie, obviously. All right, so then we go back to a flashback, which this is like a blink and you miss it scene 
from um, Guardians 2. It's when uh, Star-Lord is getting angry and he's going to fight Ego for the last time and building up the, the courage to do it. He flashes back on several events, and this is one of them. And that's so cool. So that's him and his mom both listening on the Walkman. you got to love it. And by his age, this is just before he gets uh, kidnapped uh, or getting close to when he was getting kidnapped. Uh, he's a little younger. But so, yeah, that's this takes place in 1987. And then we jump to 1988 when Peter Quill is taken from Earth. So they tell us 1988, very helpful. Uh, and then he gets kidnapped. And, oh, this is so tragic. I, I On a rewatch, I noticed this, and I just hadn't remembered it before. He shouts out, Mom. I mean, he's just seen her die and didn't want to be near her because it was too painful. Yet, that's who he calls out. Wow. But here's why the 1980 and her being pregnant when she was is important. We learn from Guardians 3, and this is from the trailers, uh, but Peter Quill says, I was eight years old when I left Earth. So if he was eight in 1988, and you do that math, that's why uh, Meredith had to be pregnant uh, before that scene in, um, in Guardians 2's flashback. So anyway, very interesting. And this all fits together so perfectly. I, kudos to James Gunn. Um, he sometimes says some weird things on Twitter that don't necessarily uh, fit with the timeline. Like he said, I think the, the Thor and the Guardians were only together for a few weeks, which is impossible. But when he's actually doing his movies and his own timelines, he is very, very accurate and very thorough. I love it. All right, so then we jump to 1989 with Hank Pym resigning from S.H.I.E.L.D., and they tell us 1989, and we get some cool appearances. We see what Howard Stark is up to at this point in the timeline. We get a nice de-aged Michael Douglas or Hank Pym and an aged up uh, Haley Atwell uh, a la Peggy Carter. So that's kind of cool, de-aged and aged up in the same scene there. All right, so then we learn also in 1989 that Carol Danvers absorbs the Tesseract energy, and of course, boom, that's when she becomes Captain Marvel. So why 1989? Well, I had mentioned earlier that there's a couple times that deleted scenes have some good lore, and I wish I wish Marvel wouldn't delete scenes that have information on the timeline. Darn it. <laughs> so anyway, in this deleted scene, Jan Rog is talking to the Supreme Intelligence, which says to him, six years ago, we sent you to locate Marvell and her energy core. Movie takes place in 1995, so now we know 1989, or six years ago, is when that flashback occurred. So, very cool. All right, then we go back to Star-Lord again, and this is neat. So, this is another little flashback scene that happened in uh, Guardians 2, right before he attacked Ego, and it's him and Yondu. And you can kind of see by his age, he's a little older now than he was uh, when he was kidnapped, uh, so 1989, but it's before he got his own blasters, presumably, and Yondu is teaching him first, how do you use them, before he then gives him, at Christmas of that year, his own set of blasters, which we saw in the holiday special. So very cool. And in fact, isn't it wild how, how close in cartoon drawing, at least, uh, there he looks uh, compared to there. You know, that looks like the same Peter Quill. That's just really cool. All right. So then we jump to 1991, uh, with Howard and Maria Stark being killed. Perhaps one of the most important flashbacks in all of the MCU, and it's mentioned in multiple movies and in multiple places. In this case, it was uh, from Civil War, but we'll see that several several places refer back to this date. And of course, Bucky was activated to go after him. Um, we see this re recreation from Barf. Uh, of the last moment before uh, Howard and Maria take off on that ill-fated trip. And then we later see poor Howard get slammed, man. It's just, it is a hard scene to watch. And, and his wife obviously getting strangled. So um, anyway, 1991. So this is kind of cool. All the way back in the first Iron Man movie, they gave us this information, not, not how he died or why he died, but that he died, December 17th, 1991. Howard and Maria Stark die in car accident. So that's kind of cool. And it's yet another actor playing Howard Stark. Has to be, Howard Stark has to be right up at the top of the list of, um, of roles in the MCU that have been filled by the most actors. I mean, at least four different people have played Howard Stark. Craziness. Uh, so then we also learn from the Iron Man movie and flashbacks that not long after that, uh, Stain is appointed the CEO of Stark Industries. And then just a few months later, when he turns 21, Tony is appointed CEO of Stark Industries. Uh, so that's important. Then in 1992, they're very clear on that, 1992, T'Chaka confronts N'Jabu regarding Ulysses' claw. And of course, that confrontation does not go well, ends, ends with N'Jabu being killed. 
and uh, Killmonger basically being an orphan and leading to all the conflict in the Black Panther movie. All right, so then we go to 1995, which is the flashback where Thanos wipes out half of Gamora's home world. And uh, you might say, okay, how did you get 1995? All right, let's look at that. So we learned from Infinity War that... Um, uh, basically, Gamora is going over all the things she hates. She hated his chair. She hated this. She hated that. And Thanos says, you told me that too every day for almost 20 years. So Infinity War came out in 2018. So you could say, oh, that's easy. Uh, 2018 minus 20 years. But remember, Gamora left him after the first Guardians movie in 2014. So this is when, she, when he says almost 20 years, that's 20 years from 2014. So since he says almost 20 years, that's why 1995. So again, all approximations, you got to understand that when they don't tell us for certain, the wiki tries its best to use all the facts available, and maybe the timeline book will give us specifics on these. But for now, I really like this approximation. I think it makes a ton of sense. All right, so then speaking of 1995, we have Natasha and Yelena being sent to the Red Room. And so we know this one, right? Ohio, 1995, they make that pretty easy. Uh, it has their dramatic escape, of course, at the beginning of the Black Widow flashback, and then ultimately them being sent off to the Red Room. And you know, I'm a little surprised they're not more angry at um, Red Guardian and Melina. Um, I mean, I understand they would have been killed. If they had not gone to the Red Room, they would be killed. But they might actually, after all they went through, <laughs> have rather been killed. I don't know. But no, at the end of the day, uh, th there's nothing uh, that they could have done. Uh, but still, boy, I just expected them to be a little more angry when they met back up with Red Guardian and Melina. Anyway, okay, so then we go to 1995 when Ava's parents are killed. And of course, Ava ultimately, after this explosion, which she's caught in as well, she ends up becoming the ghost. So how do we get 1995 if they gave us no indication whatsoever? Well, I really like the way the wiki does this. What they'll take is the actress's age when the movie came out and the actress's perceived age in this scene. Well, actually, the act, this is a separate actress. So yeah, she actually has an age too. <laughs> Sorry. And then they use that math to figure out, okay, then it would be 1995. That's, that's, it's all a guess, yes, but it's a pretty, pretty, pretty well-established guess there. Pretty, pretty good facts to get there. So anyway, that's how they come up with 1995 by looking at the difference between the actress's ages in present day and in the flashback. All right, so then we have Wenwu Wen Wu meeting Ying Li, which, thank you, Marvel, 1996. And, of course, they get together, do that awesome dance, fall in love, and we're going to see a lot more in, in the flashbacks with them as we move forward. But for the minute, we need to jump over to Mark Spector and his brother Randall drowning in a cave. Tragic. So this is, um, you know, you know the, the, after he's died, obviously. And so this goes in 1996. Now, why 1996? Well, the, we learn uh, Mark Spector's age from a passport uh, that, that's so, shown in one scene during, during uh, Moon Knight. So we know his overall age. And then we can place this because the next flashback is his 10th birthday. So uh, we can go backwards, therefore, and figure out when, this, when, when the, his brother died. And this is the first birthday without him and good old Mark's mother. So someone asked me on my State of Villainy video, if you've seen that, why didn't I include his mother as a villain? And you know, I might. I might. <laughs> I didn't the first time, but I get it. She's pretty evil. Anyway, so she refuses to attend the ten his 10th birthday. Um, and then on the 12th birthday is our next flashback. And his mother is harassing him and harassing him and ultimately becomes I, you know, at least in the modern day, we would view it as abusive. I can tell you that the parents spanked kids pretty hard back in the day, but uh, there's no doubt it's abusive. And of course, the abuse that she does to him makes him look up and see the Stephen Grant poster. And that's when the Stephen Grant persona starts to form back in 1999. So very interesting. All right. We also have in 1999, very important scene. That's when Wanda and Pietro's parents are killed and they're stuck staring at a Stark missile watching TV at the same time. Somehow the TV survives, which I thought was really cool, um, as does the, the Stark missile. And so we can place that in 1999. So now back to Shang-Chi again. Shang-Chi is born. And again, all of these dates, uh, so this particularly this date of when he is born, can be derived by uh, knowing his present age when the movie came out. Um, and we're going to see 
that they give us some definite facts to connect all this together. But trust me for now, this 1999 is the right date, and we'll see that as we move forward. All right, so then we got to jump over to Tony Stark in uh, New Year's Eve of 1999 when he meets uh, Maya. And of course, we also see Happy over there. And okay, he already met Happy, but he meets Maya and he meets Jensen, Jensen sorry, uh, who of course is very important and shows up in the first Iron Man movie. And he meets Killian, good old Killian. I love how in the closed captioning, they had to include that he's stuttering. Poor dude. They made his, him as nerdy as humanly possible. So all of this happened in 1999 and, and technically the first day of, of 2000. All right, so then we have 2004 when R.J. Nakajima is killed by the Winter Soldier. Where on earth do we get this, right? I mean, there is, there is no indication of when this happened. Well, it has to be relative, relatively recent because uh, Mr. Nakajima appears in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show. So what they did is they took the actor's age, uh, uh, the Mr. Nakajima from Winter Soldier, they took the actor's age in this scene, i.e. RJ's age, and the average age of when Japanese families have their first child, <laughs> and that is how they projected 2004. So again, I love the clever way the wiki tries to put this all together. Uh, so until the timeline book tells us differently, I think 2004 makes a lot of sense. All right. So then we have 2006. This is when Bruce Banner becomes the Hulk. So this is the flashback from the Incredible Hulk movie. Now, where do we get 2006? Well, uh, Ross says eventually he made it uh, five years and got across borders without making any mistakes. So this establishes a five-year gap between when he became the Hulk and the present day of the movie. Now, when you place the Incredible Hulk in your timeline, then you're going to want to go five years before that. Some people like to place the Incredible Hulk in 2010. And if so, then this happens in 2005. And that's where the wiki places it. I like uh, the Incredible Hulk happening in 2011, which is why I went with 2006. And again, I cannot wait until the timeline book tells us for certain, and there'll be no more debates. But nonetheless, the key thing here is five years before. And also, uh, that timeline that we looked at a while back, notice that it actually um, also says five years before. That Bruce Banner is bombarded with gamma radiation. It's five years before Iron Man. Okay, so... Just a little fun little tidbit. I believe the reason that Universal, who has the distribution rights for the Hulk, said five years is they were looking at the difference between when the two movies came out. The first Hulk movie came out in 2003, and The Incredible Hulk came out in 2008, a la five years later. Because I think originally they were hoping to tie the two movies together. Now, my personal belief is that the first Hulk movie is not canon, the one on the left. Uh, it just doesn't fit. There's too much that doesn't fit. But I'm, I'm just saying I think originally that's where the five-year came from. So I think that's kind of interesting. But we'll see if, if Marvel makes that first Hulk movie canon. I'm pretty sure it's going to be multiversal only. All right, so 2006, that's when Ying Li is killed, Shang-Chi's mother. Why do we know that? Now, finally, things are going to start coming together. So we know it happened around the same time as uh, him being seven because, um, uh, you notice there, your dad trained you to be an assassin when you were seven. And that happened right after his mother was killed, that Shang-Chi started being trained to be an assassin. So we're going to see that all of these fit together in, in, when one more key flashback is coming. So trust me that 2006 is the right time for Shang-Chi to be age seven. All right, so 2007, Maya Lopez learns karate and meets her uncle. <laughs> so here she is playing karate and, of course, Uncle Kingpin. Um, so really, really uh, menacing flashback, but we know for certain that is in 2007. Uh, then 2008, Black Widow's infamous Budapest, or Budapest, whichever you prefer, operation. Uh, of course, Drakov's daughter finally paying off that key uh, Easter egg from the Avengers movie. Uh, so why are we saying this is in 2008? Well, once again, Marvel put some important timeline lore in a deleted scene, or an extended scene, if you will. But the scene with the two of them, uh, Yelena and uh, Natasha, riding on a motorcycle in Budapest, uh, they mention, uh, you drove us into a cage. And Natasha says, the gate wasn't here eight years ago. Well, there you go. The movie came out in 2016, in the timeline, rather. And so eight years prior is a 2008. So, yeah, darn it. Stop deleting timeline stuff, Marvel. It's not fair. Keep that in. 
Anyway, uh, then we have the flashback from Far From Home, Spider-Man Far From Home, all the way back to 2010 or 2009, if you place it there, with uh, William being chewed out by Stain. I love the fact that they call back to this moment. You know, box of scraps. Just, just beautiful, beautiful. Way to go, Far From Home. Way to go, Sony. All right, then we have a flashback in Iron Man 2 back to Iron Man 1 as something that happened during Iron Man 1. So again, I place Iron Man uh, in 2010, so that's why this is uh, flashing back to 2010. But what's key here is Whiplash's father dies, and um, Whiplash plots his revenge. They're literally watching the news conference from the end of Iron Man. Uh, with uh, Tony Stark saying, you know, I am Iron Man, and then we see his father, uh, Anton, passing away. So, yeah, that this flashback is from Iron Man 2 to the time of Iron Man 1. All right, then we have 2012, Kate Bishop watching Hawkeye during the Battle of New York. Um, obviously, we all know it's 2012, but they tell us, to be sure. And I love that shot of Kate just looking out the window at the carnage, and then you kind of got you got to focus on this one for a second, but that's Hawkeye's arm and an arrow shaft as he's falling down, and I just think that's such a well filmed scene where we see it from the other side in the movie we we were looking at him falling down the building. Here we're looking at the other other angle, and we see Kate watching him and realizing, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to be cool like Hawkeye. So love love that flashback. Then we have another flashback to the time of uh, the Battle of New York. This after the battle is done and damage control coming in and taking over the cleanup of New York and basically taking it away from Adrian Toomes and leaving him with, you know, only the scraps that he'd already taken, but clearly they were important enough because he made a ton of money off of them. And of course, I'm not even going to talk about the fact that this movie says eight years later in relation to things. That is... That is not when this happened. It is not eight years later. Uh, Homecoming, Spider-Man Homecoming is not eight years after the Avengers movie. The worst, worst, worst timeline uh, graphic ever in a movie. But not going to mention that or not going to show it. We're moving on. All right. So 2014, this is when Wanda is experimented upon with the Mind Stone. Now, this scene obviously happens uh, sometime after uh, Winter Soldier and uh, has a really cool shot of the basically the the image of uh, the Scarlet Witch uh, either entering her at this point or being activated in her, however you want to view it. But yeah, really cool, really cool. So this is from 2014. Now, finally, as promised, it's all going to come together here. So in 2014 is when Shang-Chi is actually physically turned into a killer uh, by, by, at his father's bidding and leaves, leaves him. And we know that this is when he's age 14 because he says that by the time I was 14, I could barely remember. Uh, what it, what life was like before she died. So, he was 14 in 2014, and then this is key. His dad says, I gave you 10 years to live your life. So basically, Shang-Chi leaves him, and now we're in present day in 2024, and it's 10 years later. So I, man, my hat's off to uh, Shang-Chi uh, and the movie for doing such a good job of doing these flashbacks and giving us little Easter eggs of the timeline that you can put it together and it all works perfectly. So he's 24 here, and that's why, therefore, he was born back in 1999 and why he was seven in 2006 and all that. So ties it all together. Very, very cool. All right, so then we have February 2015, which is when Mark Spector is saved by Khonshu. Of course, this is a flashback from Moon Knight. Uh, and, of course, uh, Khonshu gives him uh, the ability to, to become Moon Knight, and he becomes the fist of Khonshu. Uh, and that's in February 2014, or 2015. Why do I say that? Well, because when they go back to Egypt, and, and Moon Knight happens in, in 2025, so when uh, they go back to Egypt, Lila says it's been 10 years since she's been there. Now, she, uh, that's important because soon after, if you remember the show, soon after Mark Spector is revived, he feels so bad about her father being killed. They meet up, they eventually get married, and they get married in Egypt, and then uh, come to America. So um, it's been 10 years since she's been back to Egypt. That's the key. So that's why we can place this in uh, 2025, and we can even get to the February um, by adding in that time of their courtship, etc., and then... Um, 
present day in 2025. So very cool. Uh, so May of 2020, uh, 2015 is when Wanda is mourning Pietro and bonding with the Vision. This is the flashback from WandaVision episode eight, of course, very soon after um, Age of Ultron. And uh, they're, they're, they're together in the mansion. All right, so then we go to May of 2016. This is the flashback from Far From Home where Tony is uh, sharing barf, the technology, and Quentin Beck is standing behind there going, barf, barf, really? But more importantly than just naming it a crappy name, he took all the credit for it. And then when um, Quentin complained about it, he was fired. So yeah, this flashback um, is from May of 2016 timeframe, but found in Far From Home. Now, this might be one of the most important, but also most controversial from a timeline placement um, flashbacks. I think in the movie, they probably assumed they were being as specific as humanly possible. They said eight years, seven months, and uh, six days ago, that's when they broke up. Well, here's the problem. No one can agree when the actual movie takes place. Some people put it in 2024 of May timeframe. I put it at least this part of the movie, when, when, when Thor and uh, Jane met up again, in May of 2025. I think it's 2025. Uh, Disney Plus seems to put it in 2025. We're going to talk more about it uh, because it, I think it's, there's some really interesting stuff going on in the movie that make the timeline placement difficult. But here's the real key. Whenever you place Thor Love and Thunder, then eight years, seven months, and six days earlier, that is this key breakup scene where Thor realizes, oh, man, it's over. Now, by the way, there's several scenes of him wearing the hot dog suit and all that. There's no way to place those. It, the, the wiki does its best and places them in different places. I didn't include all of those because those are really, really subjective. This one, though, is pretty objective based on when you place the movie. All right. So we'll come back to Thor. Don't worry. So Yelena, now we move to a really cool segment of blips. A lot of blips and coming back from the blip. So these are all obviously May of 2018, and we get Yelena being boink, blipped. Uh, we have a flashback, and that was from Hawkeye. We have a flashback uh, in Endgame of uh, Hawkeye's family being blipped. You see his daughter there near the target getting blipped. And, of course, in Far From Home, we get the Midtown High students being blipped. So that's kind of cool. Uh, then we move to June of 2021. Uh, that's when Ronan kills uh, Maya's dad. You might say, okay, where did you get June of 2021? Well, a couple things. Um, in the Hawkeye show, um, Hawkeye says, hey, look, you've been working under William Lopez as a lieutenant for what, four years? And now under Maya for a few years more. So that means he's been, uh, that Maya's dad was killed a few more years, a few years ago. Okay, that, that gives us something. Uh, then this is also interesting. Uh, the newscaster, when Ronan, at least the suit, <laughs> shows up, says this is the first potential sighting of the Ronan in years. So that makes it sound like it's been a while, but we know it has to be during the blip because that's when he was Ronan. So um, the, the wiki therefore comes up with June of 2021. And you can look at all of the specifics of exactly why they landed on that exact date, but I definitely agree with the wiki that um, since uh, Hawkeye is taking place, obviously, in December of 2024, that it's got to be at least three years uh, earlier, so 2021. But what's also interesting, too, is if you look at this newscaster's statement, it's the first time that we've seen Ronan in years. I'm assuming he means in the States, in New York, because obviously in Endgame, he was still Ronan because that's where Black Widow got him uh, in 2023, stopped him from... Um, you know, going on the rampage. So uh, that's interesting. That's interesting to keep in mind. All right. So then we have a bunch of people coming back from the blip. We have Yelena returning from the blip. Love that. We have Monica returning from the blip. That was really cool. And of course, those Midtown High students <laughs> returning from the blip. So yeah, lots of flashbacks there. Okay. So then we have the flashback in WandaVision to Wanda going to see Vision's body and realizing he's gone. He's really gone. And where she just bursts out that the, the, the grief, the pain, and creates the hex uh, in Westview. Uh, not long after that, we have a Monica showing up at S.W.O.R.D. and, of course, being sent off to Westview. All of these are flashbacks from WandaVision uh, put in order. Uh, and then we have a, an important flashback of T'Challa passing away. Uh, I fully agree with the wiki's placement of uh, the present day in Wakanda Forever being May of 2025, 
So because it was one year later, that means the funeral was in May of 2024. Uh, so you can look at, in fact, I've done some videos on when does Wakanda forever happen. You can watch those as well. But yeah, I believe the present day is May of 2025 and thus a year earlier for the funeral. All right, so I am including this because it's just such an important flashback. So first of all, let me say, I think that Eternals happens in 2024, October 2024. And I've done extensive videos on that and the effect of the blip and why I think Disney Plus places it there. However, if you place it in 2023, no problem. Then October 2023 is when this is happening. But Icarus meets with Ajax. And notice it was six days ago. The reason this is so important is this places the timing of the revelation that the emergence is happening seven days before present day in the movie. That's really important. And of course, Ajax is then killed by Icarus. Um, so very important flashback. Um, and uh, it is six days before present day in the movie. All right, so then we have Jennifer Walters becoming She-Hulk. And the wiki has just been updated. If you haven't looked at it in a while, uh, all of 2025 has been updated. And I agree fully with the wiki in placing this in January 2025 because the main part of the She-Hulk series is in May of 2025. And this is a few months ago. So, of course, this is where Jen gets all her training, in particular, learning about spandex. Because who doesn't need to know about spandex if you're an Incredible Hulk? That is vital, 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 vital. Your friend, right? Your friend is spandex. All right, so then we have, again, Thor, Love, and Thunder, controversial, but now this is really going to explain uh, how I think it lays out. So if you believe it's in 2024, then, then it's February 2024. I think it's 2025, so it's in February that Gore takes his vow. All gods will die. Um, all right, that's right around the same time as when Mark avoids his mother, Shiva, and the Stephen personality takes over. The pain, the pain of it just is too much. But this is key because this is just a few months before the Moon Knight series itself. So he's been Stephen Grant for a few months. Why do we know that? Well, first of all, um, uh, when he's talking to um, Mark and Mark and Stephen are talking to each other, uh, he says, this is it. Mom's death and Shiva was two months ago. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and the, But more importantly, Lila also says, I've been texting you four months. So it's at least a couple months, three months, four months, etc. But so we know when this very important event happened of his mother dying and the Stephen Grant personality taking over February of 2025. All right, so back to Thor, Love and Thunder. Um, I believe uh, the most of the movie actually is a flashback. So we already saw the flashback of Gore. Now we're seeing this flashback where Jane Fonda is... Uh, Jane Fonda. Darn you, Korg. <laughs> Darn you, Korg. Where Jane Foster <laughs> takes her blood test. And it's on April of, of 2025. Or, again, 2024, if that's what you believe. But here's the real key. I think the entire movie is a flashback. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So I'm saying everything from the final team up with the Guardians to meeting Jane and New Asgard. And this is the point, by the way, where you would look at eight years, seven months, and six days prior to this point, wherever you place it in your timeline, that's the breakup, okay? But anyway, a meeting with Eternity. And I think even Love and Thunder jumping into action, which I'm putting in September of 2025, I think all of this is a flashback. Why do I say that? Because the entire movie is Korg telling a story to all these people. He's literally retelling the entire movie. So I think present day is October of 2025 when he's telling this story. I think this fits really well. And in fact, when you view the entire movie as Korg telling the story, boy, it takes an entirely different uh, spin then. You know, because Korg might have been the one making things a little sillier than they really were and uh, discussing things uh, a little crazier than they really happened. I did an entire video on that, by the way. You might check it out. But we'll have to see when the timeline book comes out. I really hope they explain Love and Thunder. It's got to be one of the most controversial Disney Plus placements out there. But I think Disney Plus placed it in the October time frame because they're saying present day is when Korg is telling the story. Wild. All right, there you go. That is all of the flashbacks in the, uh, the movies and TV shows placed in order. So now, if you were to go out to the, the timeline spreadsheet, notice um, 
I've done a couple of things. Actually, I want to point out one quick thing before we look at the flashbacks. I have now broken some of the movies into two sections if there is a large gap. So notice you've got Thor the Dark World starts in May of 2012, and I've made a second entry for the rest of it in November of 2013. That makes it look so much cleaner because Iron Man 3 is in the middle there. Because Iron Man 3 is in December of 2012. It happens in between the beginning of Thor the Dark World and the end of it. So I just wanted to point that out that I've made that change. But here's the key flashbacks. They're all in there. Notice them. You've got from the Celestials coming into existence at the beginning of time all the way down. So that's pretty cool. They're all in there, right? As, per, as usual, by the way, there's two ways you can view this, release order or timeline order. Right now it's in timeline order. So obviously you're starting with the beginning of time. However, if you want to, you can go in and choose to sort by release order. Now, boom, we're in release order. So here's what's really cool about release order. When you're in release order, now all the flashbacks are at the point when the movie was released, right? It was released in August of 2014, notice. But then you also get the added bonus of all of the flashbacks are in order within the release date. So within the August of 2014 release date, you see the, the first flashback at the beginning of time, the 13.8 BC, a billion years BC, 4.54, etc., all the way down to present day. So, yeah, whether you like to look at this in uh, release order or in timeline order, you get something cool out of it uh, either way. So, uh, also, keep in mind that you can choose what you don't want to see. If you create a temporary view, you can say, hey, I only want to see certain things. For example, you could say, I only want to see the flashbacks, in which case now, notice there's 101 flashbacks out there. Um, then that's all you'll see. Or you could say, I don't want to see the flashbacks. So it's really powerful to be able to filter out what you do and don't want. And of course, you can sort it however you want. And ultimately, you can download this and edit away to whatever you want to do with it. So I uh, just wanted you to know it's out there. It's been updated. If there's anything else you think I should add, let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm more than open to add things. I've been asked a couple times to add the comic tie-ins. That is a lot of work. I might do it, but oh my goodness gracious, that will take a while. So that's one possibility. But if there's anything else you think I should do, let me know. And then also, if you think any of these placements of the flashbacks are really off, let me know. And in fact, the wiki would want to know, because for the most part, these are exactly when the wiki has them as well, with just a few differences where I place like, you know, Fury's Big Week and Thor Love and Thunder a little differently. All right. So also, don't forget, we do have a Discord out there. Uh, lots of comments, lots of talk on the timeline and other things. And uh, with uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 coming out, there'll be all kinds of discussion about that. So uh, check it out. Uh, I will put a pinned comment that has both the link to the um, Google Drive as well as a link to the Discord, and you can check out both. Also, if you don't mind, like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and you can check out more content, and we can all continue to enjoy the ever-growing, ever-expanding, Marvel Cinematic Universe.